Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 431. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. First, I'd like to give a shout out and thanks for putting up a five-star review of the show to Skylar Monty on Apple Podcasts. So this week's interview is with Jody Cook. Jody's an entrepreneur and writer who's created and sold a successful agency and written a number of books, including Instagram Rules, Stop Acting Like You're Gonna Live Forever, and a collection of children's books under the title Clever Tykes. Most recently, Jody co-wrote with Daniel Priestley, How to Raise Entrepreneurial Kids. In this conversation with Jody, we discuss the important topic of raising kids to be entrepreneurs, how to fix education, important principles for parents, and how to define success at all ages. You'll find the show notes on minterdial.com. Please do consider to drop in your rating and review. And don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show with Jody. Jody Cook. Wow, great to have you on the show. You and I were introduced to one another through our mutual wonderful, wonderful Sophie Devonshire. And of course, you co-wrote a book with another friend of mine, Daniel Priestley, How to Raise Entrepreneurial Kids. In your own words, Jody, how do you like to describe yourself? Wow. In many different ways, I guess. I think at the moment, I'm very much in a transition phase because I, um, the social media agency that I, I had been building for the last nine years was just acquired. So at the moment, I think I would still use the title entrepreneur because I don't think that once you sell your business, you stop being an entrepreneur. I guess we could use powerlifter um, because that's what I do as well. And then I guess writer is probably the one that's taking precedent at the moment. Yeah, it's always that funny thing of author, you know, the title, author. When do you fully lean into it and feel it? Um, so powerlifting, tell us about how you got into powerlifting. Well, I actually was a runner and I used to run half marathons and I used to really enjoy half marathons because I lived in Sheffield in the UK at the time. And that's one of the most hilly cities <laughs> in the whole of the world. And so when I was at university, I was in the cross country team and we used to go on training runs and we used to run up hills and we used to all chant as a team. We love the hills. We love the hills. <laughs> and it was because you have to, it's the only way you're going to get through them. So, um, so I started off as a runner and I started doing half marathons and then I thought, mm, I think I want to do 10 Ks. And then I was doing 10 Ks for a bit. And then I thought, Hmm, I think I want to do five Ks. And then I pretty much worked out that I should probably just stop running because I was reducing the distance every single time. It obviously wasn't the one for me. And during that time, that's when I started to do some kind of cross training. So I'd go to the gym and pick up weights. And then I started seeing very strong ladies around me. And that's when I started to think, oh, maybe I could lift that. And I'd look at what people were doing and think, wow, I could never do that. And then eventually I got there. And then I joined a new gym and I, I met someone who competed in powerlifting and that really opened my eyes to the, the world that was out there. Um, and as I was still improving with those in, in powerlifting, you have what are kind of called newbie gains, where when you first start, you just keep improving every single session and you just you're upping your numbers all the time. And it's brilliant for motivation. Um, but as I was in that newbie gains phase, that's when I thought, yeah, I could definitely start competing now. And so that's when I started doing that, which was about five years ago now. Well, and then surely, as one does in sports, one hit plateaus. And then Always. You, you, right. And you come back and, you, and that's that that's the game at some level, I suppose. Also, knowing how to compete. Uh, you did it yesterday, but or, you know, a, a few days ago. Can you do it again? Yeah, exactly. I like I do powerlifting consists of the squat, the bench press and the deadlift. So I really like that there are three disciplines because sometimes strange things happen. Like one time I had a, an injury that meant I couldn't squat and then my bench really improved. And mm. there are different things that, that the, the three disciplines, even though they're quite separate, they can work quite nicely alongside each other. So yeah, it's a, it's definitely a fun sport. Well, it's definitely the, I think you're the, definitely the first uh, power lifter and for sure the first female power lifter uh, on the show. So let's um, get into your book here, which, um, you wrote with Daniel. So tell us your journey into writing the, a book on entrepreneurial kids. Why 
would Jody Cook like to spend her time writing about making entrepreneurial kids? <laughs> I am absolutely fascinated with the concept of just entrepreneurs in general and also how entrepreneurs came to be. I think when I was 22, when I'd started my own business, I had this huge realization that no one else my age was starting their own business. Everyone's plan A was to get a job. And I don't think getting a job was even my plan C, let alone my plan A. And so it was constantly this question of why, why am I so hell bent on starting my own business? And no one around me has even considered it. They don't even believe that it's possible for them. And what I realized was that it was nearly all about role models and the fact that I had grown up with a self-employed mom, which meant that it wasn't an issue for me to go, yeah, I'm going to start my own business. What's the worst that could happen at, at 22? And so digging into this a little bit further, it was all about, well, if someone doesn't have a parent who could be their entrepreneurial role model, who do they have and what are their influences? And so that started the journey, which ultimately led into a book called How to Raise Entrepreneurial Kids. But the, the book itself came about because I sent a journal request out using a program called Harrow, Help a Reporter Out. And I, I asked two questions. How were you raised to be entrepreneurial? Because I wanted to find all those little stories that other people had had, which had led them to, to feeling like they could start their own business. And the other question, which I kind of threw in, was how are you raising entrepreneurial kids? Because I figured that entrepreneurs who were having kids were then decide, were then kind of choosing to raise them in a certain way. And I thought that I might get two or three responses and I thought I might be able to write a blog post. And actually I got 500 and they were incredible and there were people writing their stories and it was almost like they were having realizations as they were writing so they were pouring their heart out onto the page and telling me these amazing stories about their dinner table conversations and the different influences they'd had and that's when I looked at them all and I thought well there's over 40,000 words here I think this is a bit more than one blog post I think this this absolutely has to be a book and and my co-author Daniel Priestley I'd um known for a while always admired his work and also the fact that he is raising three kids I think they're all under the age of seven was a really was a really important factor for me in finding a co-author so that's when I approached him and said hey I've got this got all these words <laughs> would you like to write a book with me and as soon as I said the title his his work is all about is all about entrepreneurship and he was like yep yeah, I'm, I'm in what what do you need me to do Brilliant story. Um, Harrow, um, I've, I've worked at the media a lot, so I'm very familiar with it. How did you come into Harrow? Because it's not everybody who knows about uh, how to help a reporter out. Yeah, I think it was someone who I rented an office from a, a very, a, quite a long time ago now. I think he'd just heard of it and just mentioned it and said, oh, you should try this thing. It's always the mm. way, isn't it? Someone mentioned yeah. something. And then because I just have this, this rule where I just always carry a notebook, always, I just write things down like that and then later on check it out and then that that's harrow and then that's actually played a really big part in in some of my work so sometimes it's just listening out for little little snippets that other people say and keep a notebook and the other one i can mention in the same vein is source bottle mm -hmm. it's another of the same type so great stuff so um let me say how i felt the book was which uh, i want you to rebound on which is I thought this is actually about raising kids. Okay. Not just entrepreneurial kids. Kids that are able and desire able to do whatever they want to do, whether it's actually work in a company or be an entrepreneur. How do you respond to that? I'd say that's very accurate. I think that the the kind of demands of the future on everyone growing up now, the the skills that will make people amazing entrepreneurs are also the skills that will make people happy and fulfilled humans, which is being resourceful, being creative, being positive, all, all that kind of stuff. And feeling like you can go on and make your own decisions. I think they are things that will make amazing entrepreneurs, but also amazing intrapreneurs, but also people who can just question and look at this education conveyor belt that goes on all around us and think, hang on, is that really what I want to do? So yeah, I would I would agree with what you with with your um your thoughts about the book. And, and um, at some level, I felt it was something of an indictment on the current education system. <laughs> yeah, well, 
the current education system is just a very interesting concept because it was set up at a time that is not now and it's probably not all that relevant for now and I think that as long as there is awareness of that that you can still you can almost succeed past it I always think that did anyone succeed because of school or do people succeed in spite of school Hmm. and maybe it is (laughs) maybe we need to do a rewind (laughs) and maybe maybe that is it yeah it's interesting somehow when you set down a challenge it's not the challenge itself but how you react to the challenge that is of interest and if the school system is to push you one way it's how you push back that is Mm. of interest I think so there's a really interesting book called the, um, it's called Weapons of Mass Instruction, and it's by the late John Taylor Gatto, but it's just fascinating. And, and he really does go on a rampage against the education system. And he's worked, he worked as a teacher for over 30 years in New York. And some of the things that he calls out are things that just seem crazy once you think about them, but are so normal when we're in a school setting. So things like sitting in lines, being split by age or being split by gender and moving to the sound of a bell which is so normal in school but if you actually think about it it's like what what do we do (laughs) and so because schools are just assessed on how many people they can get to pass exams and how many people they can get to go to university or like universities how many people they can get to to join jobs you can make it, it makes sense how if you work that back it's just pretty much turn up follow a curriculum stick to a mark scheme and pass exams and I don't think any of those skills are conducive to success in in business or in life. I having lived in several countries and experienced several educational systems have a little story in my head that there is a relationship between the style of education and the style of adult that says that there are cultural differences that are imposed somehow through the school system. So if your school system, for example, never includes any group work or very little sports, as is the case in France, what that's gonna do is create far more, let's say intellectual, but very solo people because you don't know how to work in teams. You don't know how to lose with teams. You don't know how to win as a team. It's all about the individual performance and then other systems which have far more options not i mean you have to look broadly at the public and the private systems because that's you know a reality in many countries whether or not you have the choice or not but there's a a desire for more options in certain countries where they think that pedagogy must be different and you can do things in different ways and children are can be visual and auditory and have different challenges for learning and how much do you accommodate that? Or is it my way or the highway? And yeah. then you can play that out in Asia, how they have much more very, you know, really drill down my way or the highway approach. And so when you when you look at the the idea that the book is actually about raising kids, what kind of if you had a, a school mom or uh, you know, had, do, do minister of education to be a little bit more grandiose in front of you, what would you be thinking schools could be doing to do better? It's a great question. It's so, I think it's very difficult to answer, but I heard a really good answer quite recently that had lots of elements of what I agreed with. And it came from Naval Naval Ravikant, who is a um, investor and entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. And he was talking about schools kind of, being set up to basically solve interesting problems. And by that, he meant problems that you can't Google. Mm. And to set people up in terms of creating good habits and how to break bad habits and how to have a conversation with someone, and how to, how to code something or how to play or how to follow your passions or how to be, how to be a master at something. And I think mas- mastery is something that I find 
super interesting because it came out a lot in the examples of parents that we interviewed for the book. So this idea that once someone learns mastery and how to how to master anything, whether it's the, the violin or insects or or reading or anything, the point is that they can then apply that to lots of other things. So I like the idea of someone being able to develop mastery and not a bell going off and them having to change subjects straight away, even if they're really interested in something, but just going down this rabbit hole and discovering more and, and that leading on to just this fascination and also the confidence that you can master one field and then you could apply it to other fields. So I think I'd get, I don't think I know the exact formula for how schools I guess should be set up but I definitely feel like it's not subject based hmm. when as parents uh, will do we see our children not paying attention uh, it basically every other article talks about attention spans coming down because of all these Instagram YouTube -y type of children to what extent do you believe that attention spans have uh, you as a young lady uh, come down versus, you know, old farts like me? <laughs> Absolutely loads. I think I can feel it even in myself. I'm trying I'm trying a series of different experiments at the moment to to work on my focus and my attention span and making sure that I don't just just completely lose it because of all the things that are available all around me. So I think at any given time you've got notifications, you've got different things going off, not to mention, you know, the, the door going, the telephone call, it, the telephone ringing, someone trying to get your attention, not to mention, and then, then, you, then you've got the things that you actually do want to do. So we are definitely facing a war on attention. And because it's so normalized, because you just look around and everyone's just on their phone scrolling stuff, you just think it's normal. And it takes a second just to go, hang on, step back. How do I actually keep focus so I feel like I'm going on a personal experiment of focus at the moment I think it's I think it's even harder for kids because I think that they they maybe don't have the the awareness that if they're seeing adults on their phones all the times and they're just going to believe that that's the normal thing to do as well so yeah I I think it's a I think it's a real problem and the, there's a book I'm reading at the moment which is it's by Stephen Kotler and it's The Art of Impossible. And it's, it talks a lot about flow and how all the different components of flow all work together. But the main component of flow is focus. And so if you can't have focus, if you don't have focus, you never get into flow. So yeah, it's, it's super important. One of the things that I would tell the Minister of Education <laughs> is, is to tell more stories. So little story that I have is um, I, I like to tell stories, of course. Uh, so you know, I suppose that's maybe my filter. But I was in Morocco uh, doing um, doing a speaking engagement, and a friend of mine runs a school down there. And um, these so these were um, French speaking kids for the most part, uh, and fortunately I speak French. And um, I um, told him about the story that I did about the Second World War. And he says, oh, my God, could you tell the children that? And I said, well, sure. I've done a film and a book, and you know, I could, but I, I wasn't going to show the film. I was just going to sit down and, and tell them a story. And uh, he says, well, how long would you need? I said, well, how much time do you have? Well, we have a 40-minute slot before lunch, which will actually be a break because they go home afterwards. Um, so, um, you know, could, it, could we do 40 minutes? And I said, well, uh, sure, it's up to you. You tell me, and I'll, I'll fit it in. And uh, at, at uh, and also the issue is, you know, you have a, a room of 68 year olds. Um, actually, there were eight to 10 year olds. Uh, their attention spans limited and they would get hungry. And, you know, so you know, best to keep it to 40. Anyway, at, at one hour, 15 minutes later, uh, they're all uh, engrossed in this. And about 80 percent of hands are going up to ask me questions and and at one and a half hours, I look over timidly at the uh, the entire room is now filled with all the professor, you know, teachers who'd come in and listening in. And uh, the, the cook had even come because no one was at school. No one was in the in the kitchen. And uh, so finally, we let go. And, uh, you know, we had to had to draw it to a close at some point. So the point is, I feel that if you can add more stories into the way you teach and make it less rigid 
in the manner and far more interactive so that the students can own the topic. It, in, it, it it's, it's a, just such a different way of teach. And the proof of this one for me, and I'll finish here, is that um, and at the end, everybody wanted to shake my hand. It was very endearing. Uh, and, you know, they were all saying thank you for this and that. And, and then three boys at the end held out um, uh, to, to uh, w- let everybody out through. And then the three boys, one of them, the tallest sort of came over and the, the most courageous, I would say, sir, thank you very much. Uh, me and my two friends, we decided we want to help you. And, uh, and by gum, they sent me uh, afterwards uh, a few images. Uh, they, they started a Facebook page and all this in the effort of, of finding this ring that it's a family ring that's been lost. Anyway, so, I mean, talk about engagement yeah. at some level. Uh, it was just a, a delightful story. So sorry to butt in on your podcast. I wonder, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I, won- I wonder if almost the focus thing can become a self-fulfilling prophecy because like the lady at the start said to you, oh, you know, they can't focus for very long. They'll get hungry, they'll get irritable. And if you treat people like they're going to, then maybe they will. Whereas if you just go, no, that is up for question. I believe that actually 40 minutes isn't the limit. Then you go way past the limit. And actually what you're talking about, it pretty much fits in with the 40% rule of what we're actually capable of compared to what we believe we're capable of. So you talk about mastery. I, I want to. I wonder in in Jody's mind, of course, with with Daniel in the background, what are the the key principles, if you could summarize, uh, from from your book that parents should be digging in on, in terms of figuring out how to help their kids. I mean, I, I wanted to preface by saying, you know, my kids are now twenty two and twenty four, uh, and I, I I must say, several times in the book, I was like, oh, booger. If I had read this book earlier. <laughs> so, well, look, there are lots of the of the stories that were sent in, which are very actionable. And you can almost see straight straight away how that, that could be conducive to setting someone up for a really happy, happy future. One of them is this concept of doubling down. And I think it was a dad. And he said that they have a kind of, a theory in their house where whatever their kids are into they will double down on that topic and I think he mentioned dinosaurs and so his son was really interested in dinosaurs so they decided we are going to double down on dinosaurs so they bought dinosaur books and they went to dinosaur museums and they watched dinosaur tv shows and documentaries and he he even had a dinosaur bedspread and dinosaur wallpaper and it was that it was just this this feeling that he could be really interested in this thing and yeah maybe he's not going to be a paleontologist when he when he grows up but it doesn't matter does it it's just that he he learns how to be be a master at something and then could go on and apply that to something else and then another story which was by author and entrepreneur Derek Sivers whose whose work is just really amazing and who just thinks in a very in a very different way and He talked about the concept of developing long attention spans and with his kid when they're playing like on the beach or in a park, he's so aware that other parents will be kind of almost pulling their kid away from what they're interested in almost like you know like if you're walking a dog and it and it goes to sniff something. And you're like, no, come on, we've got to go and you pull it away and he said that lots of parents almost do that with their kids. So it's like, no, we've got to go for dinner. No, we've got to be back at that time. No, we've, you know, we we can't do that. Whereas what he just loves to do is just is just play, keep playing, not care at all about the time. It doesn't matter if it's half an hour or an hour or two hours. He just keeps doing that. And he, I, I guess he, what he thinks is that it turns into really long attention spans where someone doesn't think that they're going to be pulled away all the time. Yeah, if you're having fun, you, 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 won't, you won't count the time. Yeah. And it's part of the, it's, it goes back to the flow, the flow and the focus thing as well. Just letting your letting your mind wander and not being distracted by devices, notifications, alarm clocks and, and deadlines. Yeah. If you get into the world of dinosaurs, you know, these other things are, are far too modern for dinosaurs. To <laughs> but um, so it, it does feel like there's this notion of focusing on or encouraging mastery and strength in one zone. Because a lot of times we tend to sort of get bucked up on, you know, well, you're not very good at writing. You should practice more writing. 
Mm. And, yeah. and when you when you, when you wrote the book, Jody, with with Daniel, obviously, as you told me before, you don't have kids. Daniel does. You were the kid in this. Mm-hmm. A lot of the times, you know, in your voice, you are sort of expressing how it is to be a kid and how to be treated by parents and so on. Um, so how do you how do you look at weaknesses versus strengths? I remember growing up that I was always just thrown in the deep end with everything, <laughs> probably probably literally thrown in the deep end as well in, in swimming lessons. But it was very much this, this kind of ethos of what's the worst that could happen and you will figure it out. And things like when, when I was younger, when I was about seven, if we were ever going away on a family holiday or a family trip, my mum would just say, okay, go pack your suitcase. And then I would go get a suitcase and I would pack my clothes all under the ethos of what's the worst that could happen. And the worst that happened is I picked some really silly outfits and I wasn't prepared for the rain or the snow or whatever else was going to happen. But really, does it actually matter? Um, And it really doesn't. But but just, just being thrown in the deep end and being trusted to do something like that, I think, I feel like still benefits me now because it's just all these different skills that you have. And another thing was, if it was ever time for a, do- a doctor's appointment or a dentist appointment, it would be up to me to call and book them. And that was from as soon as I could talk. I didn't realize that other kids my age weren't booking their own doctors and dentist appointment. It was just so normal to call up and say, yep, yeah, this is me, this is my NHS number or whatever I said. And and that's that's just what I did. So. So there are just, I think there are many ways of throwing someone in the deep end in a very safe environment, but actually people are way more capable than we give them credit for. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I even say the same thing about adults. We have this tendency to give protocols and lists of things to do and, and, and checking in on them as opposed to giving them the freedom, the autonomy, the agency to to, to try things out and possibly fail and learn yeah. from it. It's always, you know, there's efficiency and I'll tell you what to do and control and very much, you know, get this exam right kind of feeling. Yeah. With, well, with my team at my social media agency, because at the point of acquisition, we were a team of 16. And I never, when I started out, wanted employees in the traditional sense of the word employees, because I never liked this idea of being a boss and having people that I told what to do. So I always thought of them as, well, as my team, I never used the word, I never used the word staff, I didn't really like it, but as my team, and also just as partners, partners delivering the same vision, and we were all doing it on on the same level. And it felt like that was far more conducive to productive relationships because it meant that they had autonomy, mastery, purpose. And it wasn't like just writing checklists for people and all that stuff that is just outdated. It's just, I just don't think work is like that anymore. And I don't think that's what anyone wants from a role anymore. Uh, Of the many things that are are tricky, you do talk, we're just talking about time, time management. And at some level, if they're in, you know, passionate about dinosaurs, they'll, they'll, you know, won't see time pass. Yet we have a twenty-four hour limit to our day. Mm-hmm. Talk us through what your ideas are. You do mention it in the book about managing time in the calendar with kids. With kids, with kids is difficult. With grown-ups, I think that we waste so much time, and we don't know that we're doing it because everyone else is doing it as well. I think it comes from a real sense of self-awareness. So um, a really good friend actually, he joined a gym quite recently and he joined that gym because it was about 10 pound a month cheaper than his existing gym. But he had to drive 10 minutes further to get there. So he told me this and I just looked at him with a kind of confused face. And then I said, so, so what does that make your hourly rate? <laughs> and then he actually worked it out and it was like a pound of that. It was tiny. And he doesn't realize that he's undervaluing his time that much, that he's making very stupid financial decisions, which don't make any sense because of that. And I think we're all doing it. We just, we give away our time. We let it be stolen. We, we don't protect it like we would our other possessions, but it's actually the only one that doesn't renew so I think a sense of time when you're, especially when you're running a business is just so important because 
yeah, you, like we, we all have these 24 hours and everyone can do what they can with it. But if you waste it, then you're not going to do anything with it. But as kids, do you want, do you want to teach kids that? Because is that just a bit, is that a bit much for a kid? And I think it probably is. And that's where it's more like everything's a game and everything's an experiment and everything's that bit of fun. And I think that's more important than being hyper aware of how much time you've got. Because I think as a kid, you just you just believe you're going to live forever. This is true, the infinite uh, concept. And it's this challenge of 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 recognizing finitude, you know, because also that, you know, uh, essentially comes down to embracing or understanding that you will die. Yeah, that, that's how that conversation has to go at some point, at least, you know, as the, when the dots connect at the end of the conversation. And it's my my observation that as soon as you put a time limit on conversation itself, Mm -hmm. it has a tendency to hurt our ability to listen, engage, and create. So the entrepreneurial notion, when if it's somewhat timeless, then after 25 minutes, the conversation just becomes natural and deeper, and you explore different things. And you're no longer on an agenda to talk about stuff. You're just having a conversation, time's passing, and shit is happening in the brain. The connections are happening between the two people, and it's a marvelous feeling. Yet, you know, next morning comes around and you've got appointments, you've got to go see a doctor, you've got to catch a train. So time does have an impact in, in the way that the days are run. I um, A couple of years ago, I read The Daily Stoic book, which is by Ryan Holiday and is themed each month has a different theme. And the theme for December is mortality. And the first few times I read that book, I just skipped out December because it freaked me out so much. The concept, the thought of even talking about mortality and death and the fact that we're all going to die at some point, I, I couldn't do it. Um and then I was like, what, what is this? Why am I so freaked out about December? I should just read December. <laughs> and then finally, I picked up the courage to start reading it. And then gradually, almost, I guess, desensitized to how scary a concept I thought it was at the time. And now it just doesn't matter at all. And now I'm pretty sure I've got a Memento Mori sign somewhere in my house. And, and I really enjoy thinking I'm not going to live forever because it gives insane perspective and I think it helps you think big picture and if you know that you're not going to be here someday and neither is anyone that you know it means that you you don't sweat the small stuff quite as much so I think thinking about the fact that we're all going to die someday is a really huge tool just for people achieving what they're capable of because it really doesn't doesn't matter nothing matters we talked about imposter syndrome um, Mm. earlier and I think that that's it's such a imposter syndrome is such a function of us taking ourselves too seriously and letting fear lead when actually if you couple imposter syndrome with one day you're going to die then you get to the you get to the phrase does it really matter and then the answer is probably no so uh, i want to get back to imposter syndrome in a moment but um i followed a rock and roll band for 20 years of my life i saw them a few hundred times and the name of the band is is absolutely philosophical and existential grateful, dead. And yeah. the concept is once you know that you will die, you become more grateful in the present. And uh, it was very much a, uh, a philosophy that I underscore. Yet, is it complicated to talk about with a child? And, you know, these are types of conversations that you kind of you need to be uh, smart about because you don't want to just impose it on the child. If they come up with it, how far do you want to go down? The general gist is, you know, keep answering the questions they ask, but don't force anything further. And and then at some point we become conscious adults and it's more okay to, even as a younger person, to embrace it. In the book, there's a, there's a quote from a dad who kept in the back of his mind at all times. One day she'll go to college. One day she'll go to college. And he had that in his mind whenever he was hanging out with his daughter. And he said that that made him feel very present and was he was able to focus and, and to be a good dad, um, in his words. Um, but then on the other hand, I remember when I was younger and my dad is just very good at DIY. He's just very good at just fixing things and putting shelves up and doing all those kind of dad things. And 
sometimes he used to show me and my sister what to do. And sometimes he'd say, I think he'd kind of say it in a cheeky, cheeky, chappy Essex type way. He'd say, oh, one day I'm not going to be around and you're going to need to know how to do this. And me and my sister would be like, no, dad, don't say that. And it would be the most terrible thing that he could have ever said. And we were just, I think we probably cried quite a few times. So yeah, we sure. just we just weren't ready for that at the time. So maybe taking those two examples together, it's if the parents can be aware of it, then amazing. But kids might just not be ready for it until, I don't know, until a certain, it will happen at a different stage for everyone. But me and my sister certainly weren't um, until, until I just read the Daily Stoic December chapter even a few years ago. That's fun. Yeah, I mean... You need to be aware of when the children's ready. You can't impose it on your agenda, your calendar. There needs to be that to and fro. So just now we were talking about imposter syndrome. And, and earlier, uh, Jody, we were talking about mastery and, and competence. And, uh, and you break down the different levels of conscious, in, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and unconscious competence when you're not aware of your strength. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking that the story in my head is that that is typically what happens in imposter syndrome. You might be good at something, but you don't think you're ready. You don't think you're good enough. And, and often in my experience, and I don't mean to be sexist, this is something I see a lot of women uh, up and down the age scale continue to feel that they're not ready. They're not qualified. They've done it five times perfectly. And yet I'm still not, I'm still not fit for purpose. A guy oftentimes has never done it, thinks that he is able, and then goes along with bravado which is why I oftentimes be sexist and prefer to choose a woman uh, because I think she has, you know, uh, an understated sense of competency, which kind of comes in on understated unconscious competency. What do you Mm think? Well, I guess if taking the four stages of competence, the first one where it's unconscious incompetence, where you don't know you're not regular at something, then you try it out, realize that you're absolutely rubbish. And then you've got conscious incompetence. And then you start to practice it and start to develop develop it as a skill. And then it's conscious competence. And then you get after that unconscious competence, which is where you've mastered that particular skill and you can just you can do it in a way that almost looks effortless. And I always think of like ballerinas and gymnasts in this example where they're just, it's so elegant and it's so, they just kind of ooze effortless, but it looks fantastic. And that's, um, and that can happen in business as well. Maybe someone has got this art of presenting or mastering a meeting or, or I don't know, amassing a tribe. But I think that it, it can definitely be related to imposter syndrome. And I'm so pleased that you, asked that question because I've never even thought about those two concepts as being linked before but I think it might be because you might not realize how good you are because this skill or talent that now comes very naturally to you you don't realize how much conscious effort you have in the past had to put in so you don't realize how remarkable it is I think sometimes people's best work comes from something that is so obvious to them that it's just so genius to someone else especially great, you know, great authors and great speakers, they, they're just reeling things off so naturally that they don't, they don't realize how much hard work it probably was for them to get there. They could have forgotten the tough learning curve that they've been through. They could overestimate other people in the field whilst underestimating themselves. And I think the bravado you mentioned has such a big part of it. If you're, if you're someone who's believing other people's bravado, then you're going to think, oh no, they're way better. And you're going to think, oh, I'm not very good. Um, I think social media has a part to play in that, just comparisonitis, just other people who you think are experts in your field, constantly comparing yourself to them and believing that you're less far along the scale than you actually are. And then I think it's fear. I think imposter syndrome is all the lizard brain creeping in, telling you to blend in, telling you to not stand out or show off and keeping us playing small. So yeah, absolutely. Unconscious competence, I think, is is related to imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is just a big, it's just a big fear concept. At some level, Jody, it, it is the story of life. The ability for us to have confidence or arrogance. And, and how do you compensate or, because you want confidence, but you don't want arrogance. And that's a very tricky line to teach a child. 
Yeah, I think so. I think every, so much of things in life are just about striking exactly the right balance and especially, yeah, between confidence and arrogance. There's a there's a book, um, the Stormzy book, actually, about this, this the murky story so far and about his journey from, from the very start right up to headlining Glastonbury. And I interviewed um I interviewed someone who he runs Rebel Book Club. He's called Ben Keane and he outlined that book as one that was really, really good for leaders to read. And part of the beauty of that book is this, this like this kind of his team have really found that balance between being insanely humble, but also being so sure that they're onto something and really motivated to drive forward with it because they believe it's brilliant. And how do you strike that balance of, of humility plus progress and I think that book's a really good example of a team who've done that really well but in in an individual you just have to do what's you just have to do what feels right don't you if you feel like you're being a bit over the top you probably are if you feel like you're underselling yourself you probably are at the same time the chick is for a child to have that kind of meta viewpoint you know, you're, well, hey, my dad or my mom told me I'm really good at this. Mm-hmm. Most, mastery, dinosaurs. Yeah, but, you know, do you know what a blah, 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 blah itis is or whatever? And uh, no. Uh, or, or you bluster and then you make a fool of yourself. And, and how do you reel it in, even though you have this passion and, and, and some kind of mastery that your parent has told you? How do you know when it's going too far? And and that feels for me the journey of life is figuring out humility, confidence, and arrogance, and where to sit on that scale. Mm. And also understanding why other people are acting or saying things that they're doing. Because I feel like when I was in, say, year five or year six, so 10 or 11, I wouldn't have necessarily realized that the kind of playground bullies were just insecure or they were scared of something else or they yeah. were, there was something going on there that wasn't just that they were mean and and I was beneath them but at the time I would have had no idea I would have just been like oh Jordan's sure. a Jordan's a bully and that's all you think but once you know like actually Jordan's not very happy and Jordan just needs love and Jordan just needs to maybe he's looking for a friend you just would act completely different so then if 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 Jordan, I don't know, I've just got him in my head as being this playground bully. But if I'd have realised that when he was saying, well, you don't know anything about dinosaurs, that he was actually feeling insecure because he didn't know about anything about dinosaurs, maybe we could have started a dinosaur club together. And that would be really useful information for kids to have. Yeah, you talk a lot about also the, or the, the idea of empathy and, and learning languages and travelling and meeting other people. And as soon as you realise that you're not the only perspective, yours is not the only one in the world, that others have theirs and their issues, it certainly can help. Jody, it's been a lot of fun having you on. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so, Jody, how can people uh, track you down, get your book, follow you, whatever you prefer? Everything is available at jodiecook.com, which is J-O-D-I-E-C-O-O-K. I blog every couple of days and you'd be very welcome to join me there. But just drop me a message. I just really enjoy hearing from interesting people about whatever has resonated with them. So I'd be very happy to hear from any anyone listening. And what's the best way to drop you a message? Uh, through my site, through jodiecook.com on the contact page. And just, yeah, just say hi. Brilliant. Jodie, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. Anticipating the thrill of your intellect, maybe 
wrong with challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why 